My name is Teresa Longo. I serve as the executive director of the Reef Center for International Studies, working across campus to help make our university increasingly more globally engaged. I um, also serve as a William & Mary Senior International Officer. I'm really happy to be here. This is a, such an exciting moment for us to be learning more about the Himalayan University Consortium and looking forward to the work that we can do together. I would like to start by saying a little bit about what William & Mary is, what it looks like, what, where we are. We have, this is a public university in the United States in Virginia. There are five schools or colleges uh, at William & Mary, arts and sciences, education, business, law, and marine sciences. And as we work um, to become increasingly more global, all of those um, colleges at William & Mary are involved in that work. And there are faculty in every one of those schools whose work is international, whose work is um, interested in global concerns. And, and that's really why we're here. We're, we're um, looking forward to have having a situation where uh, we're part of a consortium that extends our connections across the world and, and our collaborations. We're very interested in working together. I guess the um, next thing that I would like to say is that our center, the Reef Center for International Studies is connected to several other centers, especially the Institute for Integrative Conservation. And we've come together to help um, make this connection with, um, with the consortium possible. We are supported also, it's very important to note, by the most upper levels of the administration, by the president's office, and by the provost's office. So this is, we see this very much as a university-wide um, moment to participate with the consortium. And today we're getting close to finalizing the steps that will actually bring us all together. Some of our people, faculty and students will be in um, Nepal very soon. Um, there'll be the in-person one-to-one connections that will really start to blossom even more and, and matter to us quite a bit. Uh, in these just brief introductory remarks, I would like to do a few thank yous. Um, thank you especially to Sashi for getting us um, started already this morning with some information, and we look forward to learning so much more um, from, from you, Sashi. And I think that I'd also like to say thank you to the Institute for Integrative Conservation at William & Mary because their work is made impossible um, opportunities for faculty and students and possibly staff uh, across the university. So at, with that in mind, I think it would be good to turn um, turn the conversation over to my colleague, Safana, and we'll, we'll move on from there. Thank you, Teresa. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome again to this session for today, where we are talking about the Himalayan University Consortium and potential collaboration between William and Mary and different universities. Um, I am the geospatial data scientist at the Institute for Integrative Conservation. I'm from Nepal, so I have my own interest to be with this consortium and all the collaborations. Um, we all know the Himalayas are home to the largest, uh, the highest mountains in the world. There is a lot of biodiversity. There is a lot of um, ecosystem services, many diverse communities where we can see a direct and indirect relationships between the communities and nature. So Himalayas, it's not a surprise that Himalayas is one of the best place for anyone who is interested to learn about the connection between nature and communities and conservation. And also it is uh, now already uh, facing different challenges, it might be due to climate change, it might be due to development, it might be due to any kind of other global challenges. Um, I joined the William & Mary uh, more than one year ago now. This is my fourth semester. 
Um, and now I have been very much aware that William, about the William and Mary's commitment to water partnership, any um, research and education opportunities between universities, between organizations who are uh, interested in working globally. So I take this as a very good opportunity to introduce myself, my institute, my college, and as, as a team to uh, the Himalayan University Consortium and uh, EC mode. One of the many examples of this, these kind of partnership has been the Nepal Water Initiative that I'm a part of. And I can see there are many colleagues from Nepal Water Initiatives who have joined this um, uh, session today. The Nepal Water Initiative is a multidisciplinary research collaboration between the VIMS, which is the Virginia Institute for Marine Sciences, the Global Research Institute, which is the GRI, uh, IIC is one of it, and the Religious Studies Department at William & Mary. The collaboration is about to support the community-led water policy and management in Nepal. During our work uh, within Nepal Water Initiative, we reached out to different organizations, and at that time, we came uh, across different conversations and different experts in ECMOR, and then we learned about the Himalayan University Consortium maybe one year ago. <laughs> we had multiple interactions with Sachi and multiple other uh, uh, people in ECMOR, and after many conversations, we thought that this is a great opportunity for us to be an associate member, uh, not just of, uh, the Nepal Water Initiative, not just the IIC, but we live in Mary. So we reached out to Teresa and uh, the process is going on. So we are almost at the final steps where uh, we will be the associate member of HUC. So today we are talking about uh, how to have a very fruitful collaboration with not just HUC, but HUC is the uh, mountain knowledge partnership among universities, different um, organizations working in the Hindukus Himalayan region and also EC more. When I said the Himalayan, the HU, uh, HKS, which is the Hindukus Himalayan region, ECMOD works in eight different regional member countries, um, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, China, India, Myanmar, Nepal, and Pakistan. Uh, so it has a wide range and also, which is a good opportunity for people like us to work and also the challenge is also more so opportunity and challenges it is equally more in that reason so uh, globally many researchers many authorities many organizations like us are interested so it is my immense pleasure to introduce Sachi today who is the program coordinator of the HUC to tell us more about the HUC and many ways to get connected to HUC and the member other universities and other organizations so that we all can work together. Um, there are, like Teresa said, there are a couple of faculties who will be going out uh, in this summer to Nepal. Uh, we have students from William & Mary will be come, going to Nepal for research work. And like Sachi told us in the beginning, one of my colleague uh, who is also with the Nepal Water Initiative, Patton Burchett, he will be going before us and um, he's scheduled to be at the annual uh, retreat of the HUC, which is going to be in April, so he will introduce himself to you after, uh, uh, to you, Sachi, after your introduction, but just wanted to give this, um, this is an informal session, so please feel free to introduce uh, whoever wants to introduce uh, yourself to the group. Uh, but right now, I really want to thank you, Sachi, for this session, for this session, and I'd like to introduce you to the whole team. Uh, please tell us more about HUC and uh, more about the potential collaboration that can happen. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Sapana, uh, Teresa, and of course, Erika. Uh, over the past few months, uh, maybe um, almost a year, we've been in touch and lots of exchanges and learning about each other. And now we are here. Uh, I would like to extend the very warm welcome to William and Mary uh, to the HUC community. And we look forward to receiving the signed charter 
to formalize the membership. But nonetheless, I would say, uh, as I always um, emphasize, that the activeness of a membership is actually starting with scholar, with individual faculty member, researcher, and students. So in fact, our driving force and change maker are with individual students and faculty. That's how we see it. But then I explain to you more uh, how to make the linkage between the strength of the scholarship uh, and institutional leadership. And that is actually something that HUC is working on to bridge between individual capacity and institutional capacity. But I'm jumping ahead, so let me share my screen. Uh, before going into uh, HUC, a uh, few words about myself. Uh, my name is Chi Chong. That is my maiden passport name. Um, I'm from Vietnam originally. And I just have a uh, Shachi is my local Nepali name. So Sapana, who is Nepali, probably uh, call me Shachi uh, in a Nepali way. And I'm very comfortable with it. Now, I've been in Nepal uh, by now 10 years. Um, and I worked for ECMOD, the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, for eight years. The HUC is, in fact, um, a unit uh, at the ECMOD. International Center for Integrated uh, Development, uh, Mountain Development, and I am the program coordinator of that unit. Now let's move to learn about the HUC as a consortium. So this poster was, I think, about uh, two years old and a half. We didn't manage to update it. But if you look at this, then, of course, you see the Hindu Kush Himalayan region uh, on the map. Now, you don't see the administrative border in terms of the country, and there is a reason for it. We want to show the region in the way they come naturally, with the watershed, uh, rivers, and uh, the mountains, instead of borders between the countries. But there is also another reason behind it. The region is very much characterized by uh, geopolitics, highly sensitive geopolitics. So in ECMOD and in HUC, we are not looking at countries. We're looking at communities. And by communities, we mean not just those who share language, culture, religion, but also uh, intellectual tradition uh, resources, uh, those who share the same resources from the river or tributary, from the spring or spring shed, from a mountain. So we think of more of communities rather in terms of administrative borders. So by showing this map, which looks a bit vague to you, we also have the message to say what is not shown here and why we did not show it. Now, if you look at the core value, uh, mountain focus is what bring us together. And it doesn't mean it has to be high altitude and high or low is actually quite relative. For those who were born by the seaside, then a few hundred meters or even 1,000 uh, meters above the sea is high enough. We actually focus on upstream, downstream linkages. So by mountain focus, uh, again, the emphasis is the linkage between higher altitude and midstream or mid-hill. Uh, the term in Nepal, uh, it's uh, mid-hill and the lowland uh, or the tarai. It depends on where you are and the language or the term you use. Uh, the next uh, value that we share that bring us together, regardless of which countries we come from, is inter multidisciplinary and transdisciplinarity. Uh, but due to the space, we can't list them out all. But I want to say interdisciplinarity is, is this how we start. We realize that we can't look at snow, permafrost, water, without understanding people's perception about them and other species, um, the way how they thrive and survive, survive and thrive uh, in that context. So we start even uh, looking into multi-species uh, justice as well, not just for the human being, but also for other than human being. Now, I haven't heard of um, humanities. I heard of the School of Arts and Science 
and I believe you have a strong, uh, perhaps, uh, faculty and uh, students uh, looking into the humanities and the arts as well. So that the strength of HUC. Uh, ECMOD is very strong in terms of science, uh, cryo, uh, cryosphere, hydrology, uh, Savannah knows this very well, geospatial, anything that uh, physical science uh, for about uh, previous three decades. Now what HUC brings in is actually the human dimension, uh, social sciences and humanities. And later on, when we talk about the thematic working groups, I want to highlight the achievement of uh, Himalayan Environmental Humanities Group, uh, which is very productive and quite uh, progressive as well. Uh, they linked the Hindu Kush Himalayan with the Andes and the Arctic, uh, looking at the experience of other than human being. The next um, core value uh, you see on the screen is diversity, uh, not just biodiversity, but also, as I emphasized from the very beginning, languages, tradition, culture, religion, school of thoughts, perspectives, anything that make us different and make us connected. So diversity is actually bring us together. Now for the shared leadership, it is distributive leadership. That is a better term. Uh, you can share ownership, but leadership needs to be distributed. Now, I'm not the leader of this consortium. I'm just serving the sectariat. The leadership of the consortium lies in the hands of, in fact, individual scholars, students, those who think of themselves as caretaker or steward of the environment, of the communities, of the forests, rivers, custodians of the heritage, but then also in the leadership of the universities or institution that they belong to. So this distributed leadership actually invest in people's um, ownership of the consortium and of the future community. So this is, we, we stand behind our core values and I will explain how we operationalize it. Next slide. Okay, I'm, I'm heading uh, the share screen, so I have it. Now, these are just uh, examples of the thematic working groups, not exhaustive. Uh, the reason why is actually they are quite fluid. Uh, right now, if you ask me energy group, what it is about, in fact, is uh, split into renewable energy and then something else that uh, want to look at the nexus approach. So by the titling here, each title here is actually has its own uh, subcluster or let's say spin-off. So mountain agriculture, for example, they are not very happy to be alone. Then they come together and talk to mountain tourism and cultural heritage, which is on the right side of my screen. And then they said, you know, look, both agriculture and tourism are actually seasonal. Seasonality is something so relevant to us. Nature, but also the cycle, the circle of life, um, the annual uh, rotation of crops and annual rotation of rituals. Let's work together on the seasonality of both tourism and agriculture. So they come together and merge. So to me, I think of this group is the clustering and it's being formed and reformed and spin off and gather again in a very much uh, demand driven. So members, fellows come together and say, let's do something um, relevant together. Let's say the water is huge. You know, how can, ha how can you have a water group? Uh, this question is to Sabana. <laughs> you can't because it's too vast. Are you talking about river or you're talking about stream? You're talking about groundwater, spring shed, or you're talking about aquatic, aquatic uh, aquifer uh, biodiversity. Uh, you're talking about uh, snow, ice, or permafrost, or you're talking about something else in terms of pollutants uh, and altogether uh, the lack of it, uh, drought, right? So actually this putting the word water here is actually not convincing because if you want to do something, you start from 
a, a problems on the ground uh, that matters to the community. And then you work it up to the solution that can be adopted by them. And actually the solutions is de uh, designed with them and for them. So all of these are just example and please come with questions. Um, cryos and, so and society. Now cryosphere is fine. Uh, it is a topic uh, that Isimod is very strong about. But then the part about society is actually not that strong because those community that live at the foothills of the glaciers has not been in the picture until very recently. So again, what uh, HUC does is bringing in this value addition, uh, community perspectives, uh, field experience uh, in terms of actual perceived of uh, perception of risk, but also emotions, feelings, affection, hope, aspirations for the future as well. Uh, lastly, if you see here, uh, my climate risk, uh, putting the word mind in front of climate risk, make it personal, make it political as well. And this is not the title that I just whip it off. Um, it is actually an initiative from World Climate Research Program, uh, WCRP. And we are hosting a hub of this initiative. So again, you know, putting my before climate risk, making it really uh, experience the way it happens to us. This is my last slide and then I'm back to the screen and I'd like to see uh, you on screen again. These are the key features of our collaborative modality. It has to come from member. It doesn't come from ECMOD. ECMOD is a host of the secretariat, but it doesn't initiate, it, initiate any of those collaboration. Member will have to come together and and indicate that they want to do this together. For example, Willem and Mary may come and come forward and ask Kathmandu University or Tribhuvan University or eventually Royal Bhutan University uh, to work on certain topic that matters to you, to your students and to the community. So it has to come from, from you. Now, at least three, uh, instead of two, because if you work with two, then uh, it can be bilateral. You don't need a network for that. You don't really need uh, HUC for bilateral relationship. So if you're interested in working with more than uh, three uh, universities, and I will explain why. In Kathman, in Nepal alone, there are by now about 11 universities, which is quite a um, let's say few number, but they are not equal. So not universities are all the same in terms of budget, in terms of student body, in terms of intellectual capacity, institutional capacity, in terms of outreach and communication. So by working with different universities and you leverage the resources, stronger, bigger, more well-endowed universities can help younger, smaller, uh, universities located in a remote area like Karnali, for example, or Sudu Bastim, which is those remote areas, those who are not familiar with Nepal, those provinces, Sudu Bastim means in far west. Karnali is actually the most food insecure province of Nepal. So Kathmandu University, which is a um, premier university, a private university, and Tribhuvan University, which is the big giant, a lot of budget, can work with those smaller and less endowed university far off in the remote area. And that's the beauty of, of the consortium. You leverage resources. Uh, but actually, universities in Nepal may not work together without nudging them um, because they compete for graduates, they compete for students, they compete for faculty and resources. If you ask vice chancellors to put together, the only person who can put them together is the university grant commission, which is a grant making body ministerial level. They call a meeting saying, oh, vice chancellors, please come. We're gonna tell you about the grant making mechanism this year, then they come. Otherwise they will not sit together. They go to India, they go to Europe, they go to US, they go to Australia. They signed many MOUs with 
um, bilateral uh, relationship with universities across the world. But if I ask whether vice chancellors of Pokhara University work with Lumbini University, most likely they say no. So HUC comes in and said, why don't you work together? You know, sharing your experiences, uh, sharing your resources, making your students to be able to take the courses from each other university and doing something uh, meaningful together. So this is what HUC niche in terms of facilitate this collaboration, even in country. Now, into this transdisciplinarity, I already mentioned, and I will skip that. Now, capacity building, we can discuss more. Uh, what do we mean by that? Um, we very much emphasis on field-based experience or collaborative learning. We actually don't use the term capacity building or even training anymore. It has to be collaborative. Uh, it has to be bottom-up. Um, and participatory. The latest example I can show you in the chat later. It's a field lab that we use the format and conference. So there will be no structure, no resource persons, no instructor. Everyone coming in as learner and teachers at the same time. So we adopt that uh, collaborative learning space. Uh, lastly, this is important. Um, back to the role of ECMOD. ECMOD has a very strong connection between science and policy makers uh, at the government level and policy, policy translation, policy dialogue and policy formulation matters to scientists because, you know, without policy makers, without making them understand the evidence from science and taking climate action, then science will stay just for the sake of knowledge. So this is uh, the important part that HUC benefits from ECMOD, and I should acknowledge uh, that strength of ECMOD that we um, stand on their shoulders. So let me end my presentation here, and uh, back to you, Erika, Teresa, and Senafa for questions and open discussion. Actually, that was wonderful overview. Um... And so we prepared a few questions, but for those of you who had joined via Zoom, um, if you'd like to raise your hand or put questions in the chat, we can also add those in as well. But we'll start maybe with a few questions just to start us off, Sachi. And of course, for you, Sachi, any questions you have for us about William and Mary, please feel free. We can it can be sort of an open dialogue. I have one question, but before that, I really want to introduce one of the um, faculty from William and Mary who is there in the Zoom, Zoom session. It's Pat and Burchett. Uh, he is coming to Nepal. He will be seeing you, meeting you, Sachi. So I really wanted Pat to take advantage of this session. Pat, go ahead. Hi, Sachi. Um, nice to meet you virtually. I look forward to uh, meeting you in person in what, just a little over a week or so? Um, not Not so long. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I really feel like as, you know, the direction that William and Mary is headed and our, you know, values and trying to be involved in the most pressing global challenges and trying to do that through um, genuinely transdisciplinary work that brings together sciences, humanities, and social sciences. Um, that's exactly what you guys are about. That's what you're doing. And we're very excited to be to be partnered with you guys. So um, I won't say any more, um, but uh, I'll, I look forward to meeting you and you know I'll, I'll be um, talking to some people here and representing William and Mary, but also our um, Nepal Water Initiative. I'll be wanting to talk to you about some of the specific things that that we're up to and how we might best collaborate with you wonderful thank you so much um button button passion yes 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 i see you in about uh two weeks time uh travel safe and look forward to welcome you to isimod and godavari as well uh, i know that uh both of you uh, you and your assistant will be uh, visiting godavari uh, which is a learning lab uh, living lab uh, but again, the conversation will uh, roll uh, when you present because there are other 
new members, but other uh, potential members as well. So you can see the way how they pitch, uh, the kind of value additions or contribution everyone can bring uh, to the community. Because in the end, we are community builder. In fact, you know, university don't really need partners to train students. You can actually do the education part uh, within your own campus or maybe go into the field, but then without having local partners and community partners in terms of you know intellectual and um, community, then the world would look very different and feel different. So let's let's work on it in terms of building the community that we are serving and see how each of us can contribute to it. Um, do you want to go with the question, Tessa? Do you have a question? Sure. I, I would, I'm very interested in the collaborative learning model and I think it's inspiring. And if you could just pause for a minute and give us an example of what that looks like, I think it would be really great to hear just a bit more. Uh, we are new into this as well. Um, we used to a uh, very classic type of uh, training or let's say capacity building. But by that classic, we feel we felt at that time we were quite innovative already. Um, the reason was, first of all, we are very much field based. We believe in being out in the field. You know, you even if you are a scientist, physical sciences, you must be out and see, you know, geology, for example, if you need to learn how to uh, do the spring recharge. I don't know if you're familiar with the term. So when the spring dries out, then you figure out how to recharge the spring. Right? And Sapana can explain, of course, and colleagues from Nepal Water Initiative can explain. Now, student of geology, they look at the lab, they look at the 3D model, and then they know the, the way the rocks put together, so the composition, and identify the recharge spot. But nothing can replace a walk into the woods. You, so you must go out, going up and hike up, hike down, looking around the hill, and find it, and see it, and feel it, smell it, taste it. So we have that field component to geologists, uh, but not only geologists, I come uh, into that interdisciplinary um, team later, that it changed students' perspective entirely from the lab to the field. Because, you know, rocks has its own life, the way they communicate, the way it feels, and the ways local people think about it or about them. Yeah. So if you walk with local people, finding the solutions to recharge their spring, it, it's so different from learning it in the lab, from the 3D model, you can identify the spring charge spot correctly, but does it, is it meaningful to you? Or is it meaningful to the community? Now it brings in the social dimension and meaningful dimension in there. So we want to make sure that each of our team has the following academic, meaning scientists, social sciences, uh, government officials. We want to make sure that they are not policy makers, yes, because all of our program are early career. So they are not policy makers, but they are working in government offices and a practitioner meaning uh, local NGOs uh, and of course, uh, the co local communities and business as well, and people of media. So the proportion is 433, Four, 40% uh, students, 30% government officials and 30% society. And we keep this proportion, we keep this uh, ratio formula throughout our program. We call it, you used to call it academy because HEC academy, that's uh, how we used to call it. And we feel like academy is attractive. You know, you, you have the academy, which is a branding and make it really uh, desirable. And we change that. 
But the point, uh, Teresa, is that we started five years ago with this HUC Academy. So we run three academies. Each academy lasts for 10 days or two weeks. If you're thinking of the weekend, then it's two weeks. And if you think of the work days uh, minus the travel, then it's uh, 10 days. So it depends on the duration and how you look at it. It costs enormously. I can tell you the cost if you are interested in back then, before COVID, of course. But the value is enormous. Because apart from 433, we make sure that half of them must be women and at least two per country. Now, of course, you know, uh, the eight countries that Sapana leased out from Afghanistan to Myanmar, there are three big countries. I mean, two uh, countries that is more than one billion, China and uh, India. And then we have Pakistan and Bangladesh in terms of population. So if you think of proportion in terms of population, then um, four must be from China, four must be from India, two from Pakistan, two from Bangladesh, and one each. Yeah? No, we don't do that. We want to make sure that two from Afghanistan, two from Myanmar, and then even Bhutan also have two, because Bhutan has only 700,000 in terms of population, but they deserve two as well, because we want representation. We want their voices to be heard. We don't want dominating uh, people who speak a bit loudly and more um, a bit space taking. Um, <laughs> so we want to make sure only two per country. Even if you are China, only two come from China. Even if it is big like India, only two. Bhutan, even small, come true. So this is again, we, we thought it out very carefully in terms of inclusiveness, uh, representation, voices, empowerment, every concern, because we, I designed together with colleagues, uh, the program, so we know how to balance the dynamics, because sometimes it's quite heated debate in terms of resources. Okay, you know, you stop the dam, people start going in. It's almost like a negotiation. You, you can, because they are young, they are like 22, 23, you know, uh, 25 very passionate about their country, about their community. And then they start going into the debate about dam construction and all that. So I'm giving these examples to you that this is how we started. Now back to your questions about collaborative learning module. It used to be, of course, we have faculty, uh, 40 faculty teaching for that course alone, 40, 40, not one four, which is a lot of resources to put in <laughs> interdisciplinary, of course. But the students only 20. So the ratio faculty per students is actually the opposite. We have more faculty teaching less students. Resource intensive, but then it's worth it for the reason that, uh, of course, discipline wise, uh, we have all the scientists line up and then social sciences and eventually humanities coming in, media person coming in as well. But then we realize that may not be the way because students may know more or something we don't. They come from the community. They have the passion, they have the experience. They have a lot to share and learn as well. Then we shift to collaborative learning mode that lets the learner take lead. So we start from uh, bringing them to the same place and say, okay, what do you want to learn about? Can you find way to achieve what you want to learn? And who can help you out? So we actually start from the learner. But that is intensive, again, in terms of the resources, in terms of the process, it takes longer time. So instead of two weeks, structured, uh, resource intensive from faculty, meaning the supply end, we shift the resources to demand end. So more students and longer process, because actually not until you get to know each other, you feel comfortable, then you can start sharing. It takes a month to do it instead of two weeks. Two weeks is more like a trekking or a hiking trip. Right? 
you get to know each other, you mingle, you swap clothing, you take a lot of pictures, selfie. Two weeks, good, yeah. solid. But if you want them to lead, I'm still using us and them because you know I'm not in the cohort of uh, learners or students uh, of uh, like in William Mary anymore. For students to actually lead the learning process, you need to give them time because they need a lot of uh, iterations going back, going forth, you know, setting aside and changing their mind, quitting that group, joining the other group. It's a lot of that. So a lot of patience and a lot of resources, but depend on how you spend the same resources. So let me just uh, wrap it here about the learning, uh, collaborative learning. It takes a lot of more design thinking from faculty, so people like who design the program, like uh, let's say the director of the program core group and faculty really have to sort it out half a year in advance in terms of the blueprint and lots of scenario in terms of options. Okay, if we don't have enough people working on the disaster, what to do? If we don't have people working on biodiversity, what to do? We need to re to you know reshuffle the group asking them, why don't you pick it up something else in terms of maybe rangelands, even though that's include biodiversity, but then it's not about uh, agriculture. So people change their mind and say that, you know, I'm not really into food. Can I do something tourism? But then tourism cover food as well, food way, cuisine, uh, fermented food, uh, immune system, uh, concept of wellness uh wellness tourism so it's up to them to decide but then it takes a lot of time for us to listen so again it, the same money if you have one chunk of let's say 100 us thousand 100 thousand us dollars you probably can spend two different way one is the conventional uh resource uh, way that you know faculty decide structured and but then you can spend the same money that let students lead, but it's a lot to do at the back end in terms of planning for it and a lot of backup and scenario thinking. Uh, over to you, Teresa. I have one more question since you are talking about students and since I am bringing four students to Nepal this summer, how do the students from William and Mary or other universities coming to Nepal? And I took my students last year to Isimor. We had a couple of meetings. I took them to Godavari to show the living laboratory. But what else can the student benefit when the uh, international students are coming from US to do some kind of research project in Nepal? Is there any way HUC or UC board can give them extra knowledge or is there anything they can collaborate with the um, time when they are there? Is there anything they can learn extra from HUC? The final short uh, answer is make them work. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been hosting, I mean, HUC has been hosting a global placement program from Western Sydney University. Now, Western Sydney, of course, in Sydney and Australia, uh, they are not a mountain place. They are a dry land. Basically, the entire continent is a desert. And water issue, of course, you know, they have very strict water uh, management to the drop. They measure every single drop. And if you miss a drop, then the alarm fire as much as it's fire in terms of alarm. So, um, Western Sydney send their students to Isimod HUC and we host them without faculty, Sapana. Nobody take them and show them things. So number one, they were dropped in. I mean, basically they come by themselves, show up and they are placed with us for uh, 14 weeks, which is long time, I tell you. 14 weeks for me was like, oh, that's so long to be worried about these, you know, because of course they get sick because of water, pollution, they couldn't breathe, banking issues and all that. Okay, so all of the logistic aside, whether they can function and whether they can contribute. So the condition is that, no, 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 you have to work for, for HUC, you have to work for EC Mod. 
So we match them. Basically, they have skills such as um, uh, what they call it, um, the review, the comprehensive, no, 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 the um, systematic review, for example. Uh, they show up with a skill saying that I can do systematic review. I can do video editing. I can do something else. So they list out their skills almost like a CV, but then, of course, they don't have job experience. They, they are uh, undergrad students, uh, final year. So they show us a uh, skills that they have and interest as well. Inter oh, uh, I'm interested in uh, biodiversity. I'm interested in tourism or humanitarian um, aspect. We match. We match those skills with what ECMOD and HUC does. ECMOD is already vast enough, and HUC is too vast in terms of uh, the need from the members. So what I do is actually matching and send them to where they are needed. But of course, you need to keep an eye because they are they are uh, they have to work individually, but then they come in group, so they have a peer to peer kind of support. And many of them, I can also share with you that they were descent from. Um, Asian, South Asian, some of them, for example, originally parents come from Bangladesh or from uh, other South Asian countries. They never speak the language. They understand cert certain lang uh, certain um, daily conversation, but they don't speak themselves. So they are actually identify themselves as Australian more than uh, Bangladeshi. Hmm? But then with a lot of uh, competence in terms of global citizenship, is actually almost half of the program. They will have to, to get, uh, get through in terms of communicating with colleagues here in ECMOD because ECMOD is an international place, quite global. We have lots of um, staff from Nepal, but also from other countries as well. So they need to make their way, you know, finding the canteen, getting their lunch, participating in sport day. They actually uh, play for the basketball and volleyball. Um, 14 weeks is long enough to make friendship, you know, to having some friends and then having a favorite spot in the city. You are not tourists anymore. You feel a little bit of picking up, being a little bit local. So that is a successful uh, model, uh, but that's long, right? 14 weeks. In terms of financing, you can talk to uh, the steering uh, pattern. Uh, I don't think you'll meet uh, Nicole uh, Georgiou, the steering committee member from uh, Australia this time because she's uh, attend virtually. But I can tell you how they basically um, they finance, student finance uh, their own trip, uh, but then they don't pay any extra tuition fee. The, the university actually give allowance, uh, 500 uh, Australian dollars per student to ECMOD, to HUC to arrange their trip out to the field. So actually, instead of giving them cash, which make no sense, they don't really need it. And that's not good to give them cash because they need to manage their own financing. The Australian uh, Western Sydney actually give to ECMOD and the Secretariat arrange for them the kind of trip out for the purpose. So if they want to check out the concept of health, wellness, right? Tourism that has to do with Ayurvedic healing, um, holistic um, healing, then we find a place for them. Okay, why don't you go to that uh, Ayurvedic hospital? It's not a hospital, it's not a clinic, it's not a spa, it's all of the, the above. And I send, we send them there. We have to arrange for them to go out of the valley, which is the city, and stay there overnight and be there and come back. So that money is used usefully. It's not for a tracking trip, but for a learning purpose. So we do all of that uh, out of service, meaning you know we don't charge any uh, overhead, thanks to the membership. So Western Sydney has a similar membership to you, it's an associate membership. And we did that service to Western Sydney. That's really good to know. I'm really looking forward to have similar conversation with you later. But I think at this point, we should open the Q&A to faculties who are online. So anyone, please feel free to uh, unmute and ask questions to Sachi. Yes, I believe you.
maybe one more question. We've learned that there's so many opportunities with HUC that an hour is not enough, but thankfully we have Patton attending the steering committee meeting in a week. And this is just the beginning of a conversation, but does anyone on uh, the Zoom, would they would like to unmute and ask Sachi a question? I have a question. Uh, Shachi, thanks for the presentation and thank you to the Reeves Center for organizing this session. I'm Divya Matthew. I'm a senior policy specialist with the Global Research Institute here on campus. We actually have a field trip in Nepal coming up in September. Um, my work in the region focuses on economic development um, and we'll be there conducting some, um, collecting some data, uh, related to agriculture, related to uh, internet use, uh, what we call the digital divide. Um, my question is pretty straightforward. I wanted to find out how we get in touch ahead of our trip um, so we can plan some meetings um, just to get to know the Institute, but also to keep in mind for future opportunities to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Divya. Um, first of all, um, excellent that you're coming uh, this September. Now, EasyMod is very good uh, for this. So if, you're, if you join from the beginning, EasyMod is an international center for integrated mountain development, and that is a host of HUC. And it is an intergovernmental organization. And it has a very strong linkages with government offices. So you have, you're looking into policy, economic development, and if you need data uh, in terms of agriculture, for example, uh, I would suggest, first of all, you identify the offices where you would want to go and visit and interview, the kind of data set or the data that you need. So you need to do a little bit of homework and list it out, and then you can just send it to us, and then we will request our um, colleagues in ECMOD uh, to reach out to those offices for you. Now, usually it takes at least a month, at least a month to reach out to those uh, offices. Depends on the scale and the scope of data that you need. So the more specific you can share with us in terms of the objective, in terms of scale and scope, how far you want the data set to go in terms of decade or in terms of uh, temporary or in terms of just cross-cutting right now survey internet digital divide you know what kind of survey you're going to do so if you have the let's say concept we don't need to be too long but short concept note in terms of objectives and then the list of data that you need the methodology basically just give us a proposal but a short one very short one then we help you out we look for the right people uh for you because here in each and it's not just nepal uh this is also to tell colleagues that nepal it's just one it just happened to be sapana's country and where <laughs> i am at the moment but isimod has the same reach to almost, almost uh, the remaining seven countries, right? The same, almost. The reason I say the same and almost is that every country and government, of course, is different, federal system, province, but then also in terms of the power, uh, each, like for example, uh, Yunnan uh, province or Sichuan province in China is huge in terms of size, budget, but also in terms of power in a bureaucratic power, right? So if you do research in China, it's totally a different game altogether, but we help you to navigate. So this is a beauty of the consortium because we have university in those provinces. Then we can ask you, okay, Peshawar University, which is in um, Pakistan, for example. Um, then we reach out to colleagues in Peshawar University and ask them, you know, would it be possible to host uh, Divya for a group uh, for a week. Can you please, you know, take her to this place or maybe the offices looking in Peshawar or Gibi, uh, that is Gilgit Pakistan uh, province. So we use university connection to go to those university uh, countries and try to work it up from there. So there are different ways to navigate, but basically the short answer is yes, yes, we are here to help and we figured that out uh, together with you and navigated it, but we need a bit of heads up 
if you're already here in the country and then you said, oh, next week I need to see the ministry, next week I need to go to these statistics and get this database, it's very difficult. You need to give us at least a month in advance and we we do our best. Any faculty who have questions, please uh, send those questions to me and Erica, we can share those questions with Sanchi. But Sanchi, do you have any questions for us? We just have few minutes left, but any questions you have also we can answer at this moment. First of all, um, this is wonderful opportunity, as I said, you know, to think more clearly about the community that we are building. Now for William and Mary, I uh, capture a little bit of my note here in terms of the structure of schools, but then you have institute, you have center. So I'd love to know more, you know, how the connection between those units or structure between school and institute and center. But then that you don't, may not be able to answer in a half a minute. <laughs> but the bigger question is actually in terms of educational program, when apparently you have delegations or let's say um, troops or groups of students and faculty coming throughout the year, for example, in the Integrated Conservation Institute, for example, coming and then Divya, uh, you have your group coming. So over overview, my question is, is there anywhere that can give HEC an overview of 2025 plan of William and Mary about Nepal and about this region? I did this answer in the minutes that we have left, but we can send you um, information. So we, I think that what we'll do is follow up after this. And what I do want to say is that something that I think will be important for you to keep in mind is that the centers like the Reef Center and the Institute for Integrated Conservation and the Global Research Institute and a few others work across the entire university. So they are a good, that that is not a hierarchical, that is a cross university approach to learning and to doing scholarship. And I think that that's one of your principal um, or what could we could build together as one of the principal ways to interact. Thanks so much. Uh, that I understood in terms of cross cutting um, and benefit, right? The school benefit from every center if it is relevant uh, to the teaching and learning. So that point I got. Thanks so much again. But it's useful uh, if on the profile page, uh, because eventually you are setting up the profile page on HUC yes. website. I'd like to suggest that if you can. Um, give this overview the way you give it to me, uh, but then also a bit zoom in, in terms of research uh, objectives, or let's say priorities, because I'm sure the sure. school, uh, the center and the institute have uh, priorities, like water initiative, for example, yes. is a priority. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you can highlight the priorities in terms of research, but also educational objective as well, in terms of program, that you have students coming as a film school or field-based kind of learning or any other aspect. So please highlight that uh, as well. Then it is very useful. And lastly, if you have a calendar, as I said, you know, year yearly, uh, 2025, for example, starting from September this year, 2024 to 2025, if you already know uh, which center and institute and school will bring their group, about which time, of course, you know, things shift according to planning so that we know how to match because the entire point in the questions that you have is that whether HUC can match to bring local school uh, students and faculty to benefit from interaction with you. And the answer is yes. But in order to do that, we need to have the planning in terms of time and also in terms of the scope and budget as well. Because not until I know how big your group and how many uh, local stu students in Nepal you can accommodate, two or four or three, I will not be able to match the budget and look for them. So all of this planning has to be more or less together, um, design, let's say co-design. Uh, and I guess uh, we can do that uh, if we communicate in advance. We have work to do, but we can we can make that happen. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you so much, Hachi, for this session. I really appreciate you taking time with the evening, almost bedtime, and talking to us. Thank you to Erica. Huge appreciation for all the back work that you have done. It, this session won't have been successful if she was not here. Thank you, Teresa, for this time. And thank you, everyone, for joining the, this session. Again, if you have any questions, please write those questions to us. We will uh, try to communicate. We'll share this with Shashi. And we are looking for more conversations now. So thank you, everyone. Great, wonderful. Thank you, all, Sapana, Teresa, Erica, and Tyler, and everyone. Uh, let's be in touch, and I look forward to hosting and visit, uh, seeing many of you in person, uh, Patton, tra Travel and Safe, and see you very soon, but uh, looking again for a productive uh, partnership.